Happy Father's Day again, and uh, welcome back to this new series here at Home Church Langley. And lately, uh, it seems our series have been getting rather long. And uh, it's a series that we're calling Looking Straight into the Sun. In the first five verses of this series, we have been introduced to the Word of God, the Word from God, the Word with God from the beginning. And if you don't know who Jesus is, per chance, John declares that he is the one who is full of life and full of light for all mankind. He's full of truth. He's full of grace. He's the one who is resplendent with the glory of God, and he's the perfect representation of his Father. So John's gospel starts with a big bang. And we've looked at that for the last few weeks. But now we get to verse 6, and with equally shocking speed, our focus and our attention is suddenly pulled away to look in another direction. And that is in this verse here. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. Let's stop right there. We know that this book is called the Gospel of John. So is John introducing himself? No, he's not introducing himself. He's introducing someone else. It's a little confusing. But let me tell you, to try to explain it here, there is John who is the author of the fourth gospel. There's John, who is the author of the three letters. There's John, who's the author of the great book of Revelation, the last book of the Bible. There's John, who's the youngest of the twelve disciples. There's John, who is the very best friend of Jesus. All of these titles belong to the same guy. And scholars call him, in order to help us differentiate, John the Evangelist. Why do they call this man who wrote the Gospel of John, John the Evangelist? Well, to review and refresh, because for about 50 or 60 years after Jesus ascended back to heaven, all John the Evangelist did was one thing. That was travel and preach, travel and preach, travel and preach for 60 years. So I think when you do that, you earn the title John the Evangelist, you know? All he did was teach and preach about the Word that became flesh and changed the world. But verse 6 introduces a different John. It's this guy. This is our first introduction to John the Baptist, as opposed to John the Evangelist. John the Baptist is the prophetic voice. He's the, the forerunner, the precursor of Jesus Christ. He is the preparer of the way. He was the man who was sent by God with a very specific, very holy, supremely meaningful task. Now, I don't know if I'm going to be successful this morning. I hope I will be. But I'm going to relate this magnificent sentence, which is very theatrical in a way. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. I'm going to relate that sentence to fathers. To fathers who are, for the most part, sold short these days. For the most part, who are kicked to the curb these days. Who are, for the most part, terribly, terribly undervalued these days. When, in fact... They too are men sent from God with a specific, holy, supremely meaningful task. This is my thesis, and this is my task for this morning, and it's a tall one. I'm going to share with you, number one, what that supremely meaningful task is. But first, I'm going to introduce to you the man himself, John the Baptist, the greatest man That guy in the camel skin is the greatest man who ever lived, according to Jesus himself. And if Jesus says something, you know it's true, because he's the truth and everything he says is truth. So he said that furry guy is the greatest man who ever lived. That's our first task in the outline to introduce you to him. Secondly, 
I'm going to try to show you how his task is remarkably similar to our task. And then thirdly, I'm going to uh, briefly mention the anticipated results and the joyful outcomes of living such a life. So here we go. Let's get the whole context now. There was a man sent from God, and his name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. He came only as a witness to the light. So you understand that for 400 years, from 400 B.C., basically, until Jesus was born, the voice of prophecy had been as silent as a stone. But here, after 400 years, the voice of prophecy begins to speak again through this man, John the Baptist. In, in Luke's gospel, you know there's four gospels, one of them is Luke's, we learned that the birth of John the Baptist was prophesied to his father, whose name was Zachariah. And for those of you who are really new to the Bible, this may be blowing your mind already, but just let me tell you the story. The birth of John the Baptist was prophesied to his father, Zechariah, by the angel Gabriel, no less, who is the top dog angel in heaven. And this happened when Zechariah was fulfilling his duties, doing his job as a priest in the temple. And I don't know if you've read the story lately, but it's one of the classic, classic stories in the Bible. There was Zechariah the priest, he's working all by himself, burning incense, in the holiest place in the temple. And he's totally dialed in. He's focused on his task. Because he's a good priest. He's a faithful priest of the Most High God. And suddenly, without warning, he sees he's not alone in the Holy of Holies. He sees that standing beside the altar of incense is an angel, who turns out to be Gabriel, who tells him this, Quickly, before Zechariah has a heart attack, he says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. And you will call him, you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you. And many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He's never to take wine or other fermented drink. And he'll be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. He will bring many back. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to make their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. To make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I didn't read that particularly well, but you got the, the, the gist here. What a, what a glorious announcement. I could camp on any one of these four points. It's a glorious announcement as a man of prayer because he's told that God has heard your prayers. That's cool all by itself. Secondly, it's a glorious announcement as a father. Because he's told that your son, Zachariah, is going to be an absolute joy and delight to you. And Carol, I remember you said that in your little speech as you said goodbye to your son, who got married on Friday, that he was a joy and a delight to you, and you referred to that verse. It's a glorious announcement as a, as a, a devout Jew, because he's told that the Lord is going to move powerfully among the Jewish people, and thirdly, it's a, fourthly, rather, it's a glorious announcement as a family man. Just as a family man, because God was going to turn the hearts of parents and children towards each other. And for all of us who are parents, there is nothing sweeter on the face of the earth than to have the hearts of your children together with your heart. Just one tiny problem with this announcement, and that's that Zachariah is a really old man. And his wife, Elizabeth, is a really old woman. And so, this is the irony of it all. Even though Gabriel has told him, Zachariah, your prayers have been answered. You know, so he's been praying for a child. 
And then he gets the appearance of someone who is literally 10 feet tall, the Gabriel, the, uh, Gabriel the angel, and says, your prayer's been answered. So he's been praying. He gets an angel appear to him, tell him it's answered, and he doesn't believe it. <laughs> That's kind of weird. He doubted the angel's words. And so the angel punished him and said, dude, until the day comes when your baby boy is circumcised and named on the eighth day of his life, you're not going to be able to say a word. That was the punishment. And that's what happened. But the most important thing I can tell you about Zach and Liz, which is their Hollywood name, you know, uh, Zachariah and Elizabeth, it's Zach and Liz, or Ziz, uh, is that Elizabeth was related to who? Who is her most famous relative? Mary, the mother of Jesus, was her very own relative. And Mary had her own visit from the angel Gabriel. And Mary was so excited about this visit, as you can imagine, when any of us ever get visits from angels, we generally tell people about it. She had her visit, and so she raced over to tell uh, Elizabeth, her cousin, about what happened. And you know what, what happened in the story then? The baby inside Elizabeth's womb, who was John the Baptist, goes nuts when Mary walks into the room. He, it just starts doing handstands and cartwheels and, and starts preaching and prophesying. Who knows what else John the Baptist was doing inside there. But he's basically reacting to the presence of Jesus Christ in Mary's womb. It's incredible. And three months later, Elizabeth has her baby. And there they are at the circumcision and naming ceremony. And uh, Elizabeth and all the other talking relatives are discussing what to name the baby. And one says, how about Fred? I think Fred's a great name, don't you think? And another relative says, no, 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 should name him after the father. Call him Zachariah. And someone else says, no, 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 let's call him Robin Van Percy. <laughs> yes, let's call him Robin Van Percy. And they said, no, no, no. Anyway, Zachariah is standing there during this discussion, and he's impersonating a Dutch windmill. <laughs> he's, he's saying no. He, he, well, he's not saying no. He's just trying to stop them. And he, he grabs a writing tablet, and he scrawls out the words, His name is John. And at that very moment, his tongue is loosened, and he lets fly the highest praises of God and a prophetic blessing for his son, and it went a little something like this. And you, my child, will be called the prophet of the Most High. This is the first words that he's spoken in nine months. And you will go on before the Lord to prepare the way for him, to give his people the knowledge of salvation through the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, by which the rising sun will come to us from heaven, to shine on those living in darkness. Note that. And in the shadow of death, note that, to guide our feet into the path of peace. This is a prophetic word about what Jesus was going to accomplish. And John the Baptist would announce it. Fast forward now two years. There's little baby John the toddler. And there's Jesus, six months younger, another toddler. And a third character enters our story, the paranoid, delusional, power-hungry King Herod, who decides it's a good idea to kill every single boy in the region who's two years or less in order to protect his hold on the throne. And so warned in a dream, Mary and Joseph flee to Egypt, so they're okay. What about baby John? What about baby John? You know what tradition tells us? Tradition tells us that in that baby bloodbath, Zechariah was killed by the soldiers. You know why? Because he wouldn't give up the whereabouts of his son like a good father would do. He would not disclose the location of his son who was actually with his mother Elizabeth fleeing to the desert while they spoke. So she flees, flees to the desert with a one-and-a-half-year-old. 
And that's where she raises her son. Being an old woman, she died relatively soon. And some say that after she died, John was adopted by a desert community of monks and ascetics where he continued to live a celibate life, a strict and regulated life, according to the prophecy about him. No wine, no women, no song. He never cut his hair, and his priorities were exactly four in number. One, study hard. Two, pray hard. Three, repent hard. And four, live in solitary. Live in solitary. Then finally, at the age of 30, John goes public, and he starts to preach, complete with his camel hair t-shirt, his piercing eyes, his booming voice. He starts in the Jordan Valley, and he takes on the entire religious establishment, for starters. And the people were fascinated by this guy. They flocked by the crowd to hear him preach. And they submitted themselves to his baptism of repentance. But the thing is, many people gave John a higher place than he really should have had. So did you know that 20 years after the resurrection of Jesus, 20 years later, there were still groups of people who followed that guy, even though he had been dead for years. They still followed him. They made the mistake, now listen close, they made the mistake of worshiping the preacher rather than the message that he preached. Now I know you're not going to worship this preacher, but there are good preachers out there. Look at this. The Apostle Paul encountered some of these guys. It says Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Kelowna or Ephesus or something. And he found some disciples, and he asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? And they answered, No. We never even heard there's a Holy Spirit. So Paul said, What baptism did you see, receive? John's? Oh. Paul said, Listen, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him. Oh, we missed that. He told them to believe in Jesus. Oh, we missed that. And so on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, and Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, just like the Holy Spirit's coming on you, Denise. The stuff you, you were baptized last Sunday, and the stuff you told me this morning, incredible. The Holy Spirit's on you. And they spoke in tongues, and they prophesied, and there were 12 men in all. So a small group, but they made the mistake of worshiping the preacher rather than the message that he was preaching about. And so that's why, as we now move back to the Gospel of John, Every time, every time John the Evangelist makes a reference to John the Baptist, did you know in the Gospel of John, he puts John the Baptist in his place. Every time he refers to John the Baptist, he puts him in his place. And so here's the first one. He says, listen, he himself, John the Baptist, he won the light. He only came as a witness to the light. And people have to understand that in comparison to Jesus, the Word of God, the Word from God, the Word who was with God from the beginning, John the Baptist was nothing because he wasn't the light. Even though John's role was foretold in prophecy, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord. This is 700 years before Jesus came on the scene and 700 years before John the Baptist came on the scene. Make straight in the desert a way for a highway for our God. Every valley shall be raised up, every mountain and hill made low, the rough ground made level, the rugged places a plain, and the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all people will see it together. Even so, even so, John the Baptist had this part here in one of the greatest Old Testament chapters, Isaiah chapter 40. Compared to Jesus, he was nothing, because he was not the light. And even though everything about John the Baptist screamed out holy prophet from the modified Tarzan suit to the mouthful of grasshoppers to the home in the Thule's, yet compared to Jesus, he was nothing because he wasn't the light. And even though in Jesus' own opinion, John the Baptist was the greatest man who ever lived, greater than David, greater than Abraham, greater than Elijah, greater than Moses. 
Jesus said, truly I tell you, among those born of women, there's not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Even so, compared to Jesus, the greatest man in the world was nothing. Because he wasn't the light. Do you see the point? Not only does John the Evangelist put John the Baptist in his place, he puts all of us in our place. Ladies and gentlemen, especially the gentlemen, beware of something called the pride of life. What a man is, what a man has, and what a man does. Are you listening? In his first letter, John writes that the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. Successful men are particularly susceptible to the pride of life. Their accomplishments, their possessions, their trophies, their victories. And it goes to their head. And they think they have the tiger by the tail. And they start to forget all humility. They start to forget all the rules of the game and stop playing by them. And most of all, they forget God. And secondly, don't get all excited about the successes of other men that you know, men. Don't say, wow, look at that guy. Look what he's accomplished in such a short space of time. Look at that guy's family. It's perfect. Look at that guy's trophy wife. No, I mean, look at her. Look at that guy's job. Shuffles a few papers around and he makes six figures. Doesn't matter. Even the greatest man in the world is nothing compared to Jesus the light. The greatest man in the world is not the light. Jesus is the light. So what's our role? What's our job? At the very top of our job description, as fathers, as husbands, as men, here it is. There was a man sent from God whose name was Jerry, and Keith, and Frank, and Don. But they weren't the light. They weren't the light. They just came as a witness to the light. The light that was in the beginning. The light that was with God. The light that is God. And it ain't us. I'm just a man. I'm just one of his creatures. I was born in 1960. And one day I'm going to have a heart attack or cancer. I'm going to go to the hospital and I ain't coming home. There is no doubt about it. And so what's my life all about? Is it about accumulating stuff? Is it about... Having the perfect family, is it about piling up money for other people to enjoy when I'm dead? That makes no sense. But it makes sense if you think you're the light. Then it makes a lot of sense. But I'm not the light. My job, my calling, my task, and yours is to be a witness to the light. Be a witness to the greatest thing that has ever happened in all of history when God spoke his word became flesh and lived among us full of grace and full of truth. That is our job. So how do we do that? What does it take to be a decent witness to the light? John's gospel mentions five ingredients. This word witness is a power-packed word. You'll find it throughout John's gospel. Just like you'll find the word life throughout. You'll find the word light throughout. He also uses this word witness. As a witness to the light, the first ingredient is that you've heard God the Father endorse Jesus his Son. Like you can be a God-fearer, you can be a religious dude, you can be Buddhist, you can be uh, Muslim, you can be all kinds of different things, but have you heard God the Father endorse Jesus the Son? Because that's what a Christian is. Anything else is not. Jesus said, the Father who sent me has himself borne witness to me. And that means you've been affected, you've been moved, and you've been touched. You've heard the inner voice speaking to you about the way, the truth, the life of Jesus Christ, and you haven't turned away. 
On the contrary, you've been drawn to him. You've agreed with him. You've accepted him and you've chosen him because you've heard the voice of the Father endorsing Jesus Christ, his Son. Secondly, as a witness to the light, Jesus Christ himself has convinced you and captured your heart. Jesus said, if I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true. If I do bear witness to myself, my testimony is true. Jesus was his own best witness. That's kind of weird, but it's true. Jesus was his own best witness because he, he claimed to be the light and then he lived it gloriously. He claimed to be the life and then he lived it perfectly. He claimed to be the truth and then he lived it flawlessly. He claimed to be the way and then he lived it beautifully. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be one with the Father. He claimed to be the Savior of the whole world. And for a witness of the light, you're convinced that he was. That's the second thing that makes you a good witness. Thirdly, as a witness to the light, you believe in his works. Jesus said, the works I do in my Father's name, they bear witness to me. When John spoke about the works of Jesus, he was talking about two things. One, he was talking about the spectacular. The miracles, the signs and everything. The other thing he was talking about is the unspectacular. About Jesus' everyday life. His life of love and mercy. His life of compassion and forgiveness. His life of service. All these things showed that he had been with God and that God was with him and in him. And you believe it to be true. You believe in his works. That's the third thing that makes you a good witness. Fourthly, as a witness to the light, you believe in the scriptures with all of your heart. Jesus said a couple of things about this. He said, search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is they that bear witness to me. All the scriptures. A few verses later, he said, if you had believed Moses, you'd believe me because he wrote about me. Wait a minute. What did Moses write? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers. He wrote about me. So did David. So did Ezekiel. So did Jeremiah. In fact, did you know that Jesus Christ is written about in every single one of the 66 books of the Bible? I don't have time to read it all to you, but check it out. Like I said, I don't have time. He's there. New Testament. He's everywhere. On every page. The Old Testament basically says Jesus is coming. The New Testament says Jesus is here. The thing is, you've seen it and you believe it to be true. That's what makes you a witness to the light. And the fifth thing I've already flicked on the screen here, you believe the people that Jesus has impacted. People like this first lady here, the woman at the well. After her life-changing talk with Jesus, she races back into town and she says, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? And many people did believe her because 10 verses later it says, Many of the Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. I just have to say this. Jesus knows everything you did. Period. I just, that's for free today. I'm just throwing that out there for free. That got written in there at six this morning. Jesus knows everything you did. Secondly, you not only believe this woman here, you believe this guy there from John chapter 9, a man who was born blind. And yet Jesus healed him. And after he's healed him, did, wouldn't you think there's a celebration? No, nope, no celebration. Inquisition. Inquisition for this guy by the religious leader, leaders who want to get to the bottom of how in the heck did this healing come to be? They put him on trial. 
That didn't help. They put his parents on trial. That didn't help. Because they just kept claiming over and over, it was Jesus' healing power that healed him. And at one point, the guy shouts out, he says, listen, whether Jesus is a sinner or not, I don't know. I only know one thing. I was blind, but now I see. It's a great testimony. There's a legend about how the scribes and Pharisees looked for witnesses when Jesus was on trial. So can you imagine this? So we're fast-forwarding a few years now to the end of Jesus' life. Jesus is on trial. The scribes, the scabs and parasites, or the scribes and Pharisees, as they're otherwise known, they wanted witnesses to, to condemn him. And so they called for witnesses. And here comes all these witnesses. The first witness gets on the stand and says, Yeah, uh, I was a leper and Jesus healed me. The second one, I said, you're no good, get off. Another one comes and sits down and says, I was blind, but Jesus gave me my sight back. Oh, no, you can't. Get out of here. Another one says, well, I was deaf, and now I can hear. These are not the witnesses we want, but these are exactly the kind of people who point to the light and who are actually marvelous witnesses for the light. So if Jesus Christ has impacted you, Your job is to point to the light, to not brag about yourself, but to brag about him. Back to JB, what he said about his cousin Jesus is the the greatest quote of anything John the Baptist ever said. He said, he must become greater, I must become less. He must increase, I must decrease. And I remind you, those words are coming from the greatest man who ever lived. And yet, even though the greatest man who ever lived said that, he was just a flickering match pointing to the one who has the brilliance of a trillion suns. And that's not even accurate. So this is our supremely meaningful task, men and women, For every man, every father, every true disciple of Jesus Christ who is the light of the world, the supremely meaningful task that we have is to point to the light, not at yourself, to brag about the light, not about yourself, to give glory to the light, not to yourself, and then the five things that make great great witnesses. To listen to the voice of God endorsing Jesus the Son, to believe the testimony of Jesus himself, who was his own best witness, to believe in his works, to search the scriptures and see that from page one to the end of Revelation, they all bear witness to him, and to listen to the testimony of people that Jesus has impacted, because they're not crazy. Jesus has changed the lives of untold millions of people, including a bunch here. One final point. He came as a witness to testify concerning that light so that through him all might believe. Did you catch those words, through him? My question is, who is this referring to? Who is him? It's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. Through him all might believe. I've checked the very best commentaries, and the word him is the object of this text. It is John the Baptist. Through him all might believe. Through John the witness to the light. Through John the reflector of the light. But it may just as well as say you. It may just as well be you or me. So that through you and through me all might believe. This is the conclusion of the matter. This is the result. This is the outcome of a good, clear witness to the light is that people will believe Jesus through you. And so on this Father's Day, I say, let it be. This is the blessing for all you men here. Let it be that all of your kids, let it be that all of your grandchildren, let it be that your wife, Let it be that your ex-wife, from the time before you had ever seen the light or believed in the light, let it be that your co-workers, your brothers, your sisters, your aunts, your uncles, that everyone in your sphere of influence 
will see that you are a clear witness to the light. Here is my final wrap-up. There came a man sent from God. His name was... Let us pray. His name was... Fill in your name. There came a man sent from God. His name was... Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we just want to thank you that we have such a high purpose in life to point to the light. Thank you that our lives do not amount to piling up goods and uh, achieving accomplishments, getting titles and degrees after our name, but thank you that we have a much higher calling than that to point to the light to whom we compare like a match and a trillion suns. Lord, forgive us for getting all excited about the match when there is a trillion suns to get excited about. The Word who became flesh, who dwelt among us, who lived a perfect life of grace and truth, and who gives us ultimate meaning, ultimate purpose. Oh Lord, would you help us to do a good job as reflectors of the light. I pray that you'd help every man here, from Don to Jack to all the rest of us, to be good reflectors of the light until the very day that our light goes out and we go to be with you. And I pray that um, uh, your Holy Spirit would help us to do that, to do it well. I pray that these marvelous words, there came a man sent from God and his name was, and we put in our own name there, I pray that that would be true for us, that we would live it. (laughs) 